All right, welcome everybody. Today's video finds us over here in Pimai. We're uh, in the Kom Ratchasama province. We're about five hours or so away from Bangkok. So I came up here today to see the largest Khmer temple in Thailand. It's uh, about 250 miles down the road from Angkor Wat. The Khmer built a road that uh, connected this area to the main part of their kingdom. So anyway, there's several like famous temples that are from the Khmer era that are built along this road. The most famous are in like Buriram. There's two of them. There's one up on the hill and then there's one, uh, they call it the lower city. But those are smaller than this one. This one is the largest one inside of Thailand. So it's uh, said to be a really important site for the Khmer. It was obviously an important outpost. It kind of opened up the southern part of their kingdom into Thailand. So we're gonna walk around here and we're gonna take a look at it and uh, hopefully it'll be a good time. This is the little city of Pimai. You can see they got some of the old wooden houses, the two-story houses that are pretty common in a lot of these little towns. And then right over here, this is the entrance into the historical Here's part. The, uh, little ticket window. It's 100 baht for a foreigner. It's 20 baht for Thais. So it's open from 7 to 6 o'clock. And then here's the ticket that they give you. So we got a monk over here. He's uh, being a tourist also. I don't know if you can hear that. There's some uh, music that's being played. It's election season in Thailand. Tomorrow is the big general election, so they're out uh, trying to drum up some support. Now, when you come here, you gotta be polite. They have signs up saying, you know, you need to present yourself in a in a nice manner. Don't be any engage in any lewd acts and stuff like that. Don't disrupt the monuments and you know do like graffiti and move stuff around. Okay, so this building here they call the Pla Pla Plung Krung or something like that. They say it was constructed in the 12th century and this was used by the king. They would uh, perform ceremonies in here. So let's take a look. So it has the high threshold and then the Khmer, the Khmer were absolute masters at stone masonry. You can see they put these uh, carved stones around the windows, around the doors. I believe there was like a three-step procedure that they would follow when they would carve all the details in. You can see how old and weathered this is. This at one time had figures you could see, but now it's uh, kind of weathered away. And they did a fantastic job. So you, this is a nice look at this. So you can see how they constructed it. So they carved and they fit these stones just absolutely perfect. So this would have all been reconstructed, but they, you know, when possible, they would use the original stones. And then here's another like normal Khmer style window. So they would have put these up in all of the windows. So they carved them and then uh, put those on the outside. And you can see where they drilled holes. So they drilled holes in these and then they would bring them into place. They would carry them on these like wood sticks. They'd set the stone and then they'd break that, the wooden stick that they used to carry it off. And then the wood is rotted away. So all that's left is the little hole. But check out that this is just massive. And this is, we're not even into the main part of the temple yet. So we're just walking around the outer courtyard and then you can see the inner part. It looks like you got some heavy rain over here. It was really cloudy in front of me, but it didn't rain on me. I'm not sure how big this building is, but it looks like it's about maybe 40 meters by 30 meters or so. So it's quite large. Now this whole temple, I believe, is 1,000 meters by 600 meters. And it would have been surrounded by a wall and a moat, just like the normal Khmer stuff would have been and it would have uh, resembled Angkor Wat, I believe. 
So you can see the stone workings that they've done here. Yeah, this is fantastic. Just this huge open area. Yeah, so these stones here would have been quarried probably somewhere nearby. I'm not sure where they quarried them at. And I'm not sure if there's a beret here or not, which was the Khmer water storage. When you uh, come in one of the directions into this area, you can see kind of a pond, but it's all in Thai, and I couldn't tell if it was maybe an old Khmer beret, because they, uh, they were masters also. They were stonemasons, and they were also masters at uh, maintaining their water. That's what they would do. They would store water and then use it to irrigate their crops and stuff. Okay, so let's go over to the next part. We're coming up to what they call the Naga Bridge. So this was built roughly in the 12th century. You can see it has the lions here and then the Naga. These look like they've been restored. They're in too good a shape for that standstone to be looking like this. A lot of times you can see where they've connected like the new parts like right here onto the old existing part. Well, this one here looks quite a bit older. Now the Naga is supposed to connect the, the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. That's what it means in like the Buddhist and the Hin Hindu religion. And when you go to the one in Buriram, I made a video of there a little over a year ago, I guess, but they have a humongous walkway that comes in that's built like this, but it's, it's like 100 meters long or more. It's just absolutely massive. And this kind of reminds me of that, but it's just a little bit smaller. But still the same styling and the same feel. Okay, so here we come into the, these are the arch gateways and the campaign cow. So they have these big, huge holes in the stone. Not sure what that's about there. I don't know if that was part of the remodeling or if the Khmer did that. You can see the figures that they've carved in there. Now the shape of this is in a, like a crucifix. And then this little walkway is supposed to lead you into the middle. The inner realm is where the deities reside. The Khmer kingdom is just absolutely fascinating. Now at the time when it was at its peak, one out of every thousand people resided in the Khmer kingdom. The one out of a thousand people on earth. And it's a kingdom that nobody really knows too much about. I mean, outside of the people in this area. I mean, it's not something that I ever studied in school. I've had to read about it since I've got out. And it's just a fascinating culture and a kingdom that, that rose to prominence and then uh, disappeared. And they left behind all of these fantastic buildings. I mean, they worked I mean, endlessly on Corian stones, shaping them, hauling them into place, and then building these magnificent temples. And it looks like right here, it looks like there's uh, some inscriptions in this. That's pretty interesting. And here's a nice look at some of the windows, how they had that, those stones put there. And then here, these carvings in these stones are in fairly decent shape. And then some more of those that cover the windows. And then we'll go in there now. That's the main part of this. And these stones here are just absolutely massive. And then you can see how they put those little arches over them. And then these figures here have kind of weathered away. Now, I don't know if they used uh, elephants to move these big stones. I would assume they did but they also have the holes drilled. I've seen pictures of them using elephants to move around these big stones. Thailand used to do that until fairly recently. They would use elephants as beasts of burden out on the farms and stuff. But you can see the outer wall. And then over there might be a pond or something. I'm not sure what that was. And then it had some more buildings here that are just down to the bases. And that's what we came to see is the center part right there. Oh, that is magnificent. And then over here, we had some more, uh, looks like some more buildings and another pond. And that tree's kind of taken over the ruins of that one. So this is what's left of the pathway. Now they also had like 
some of the temples I've been to had like water around them and they would use them as their ceremonies. They would have stairwells down into like the, the water features built into the temple. The main one that I can remember like that is the, the lower city over in Buriram. They had stairwells built down into it and they would uh, do ceremonies with the water. You can see they've carved the base of all these stones also. Now they've kind of deteriorated, but you can still see the work that they put into it. And then the inner wall, the same. They have those little column stones that are in all of the windows. And then the, the stone over all the, the doorways. That's kind of interesting. So this rectangular building here has false windows on the outside, but you can see those stone balustrades that they call them. I guess it's uh, Luc Mahut, I think is how you say it. That's what those are. Now there's supposed to be an inscription here on a statue of one of the local rulers from 1108. The local ruler was Senapatai Trilohamavinyayam or something. <laughs> oh, check out that building over there. Oh, that's cool. So they've restored this, as you can see here, they put this uh, wooden pathway in, making it a lot easier to get in. When I was in Angkor Wat last year, I guess, there was a couple of the temples where it was pretty rough to get inside, but this one here is quite nice. Okay, so here they're saying that these holes had some of the important objects. So they had a gold leaf, uh, eight petaled lotus, and they've uh, moved those over into the Pimai Museum. It looks like they're doing some work here to kind of restore this part. And you can see, so that stone there didn't belong there originally, but they've put it in. And they have some more of those holes. Now this was built as a Buddhist temple, while the, at the time the Khmer were Hindu, but they knew that the religion here was Buddhist, so they built this temple as a Buddhist temple. This is fantastic. So they put that in there to kind of keep it from collapsing down. So the whole area here would have been a covered walkway. Oh, that's great. So this is one of the smaller prongs and there's no entry into there. And you can see they have that little stone right there. Now I believe that's Hindu. It's for, uh, they put that stone and they pour water over it. It's uh, something to do with Shiva. And then you can see some more of the inner courtyard. This is that smaller little prong. So it was built in the 13th century. You can see it's not near as in good a shape. They haven't done as much to restore it. You can still see kind of the, the way it was built though. Well, this one here, this is the one that was built in the 11th century. And they've spent a lot more effort into restoring all the, the figures into all of those stones. And then they have some of the smaller little libraries. I think that's a library over there. So they say that there was actually, uh, they found a deal for Shiva. That is what that is there. And it's made out of red sandstone. And this is a uh, Ho Brahma, also made out of that red sandstone. And then the center part. Now you can go into this little prong over here. Let's go into that right quick. This is that second little prong. Now they actually use the uh, sandstone and that laterite stone. The laterite stone you see a lot more in the construction of the Khmer stuff. Also, if you go up to like Camping Pet, you see all of this laterite. Now they said that they found a statue of someone that they believed to be was uh, King Jaravarman VII. That's the, one of the most important Khmer kings. So this is inside here. So the original statue here is in the museum. That's pretty interesting. You can hear all the pigeons up here. I'm sure bats come out of here also at night. Oh, those pigeons are loud. Yeah, I love coming in and seeing stuff like this. It's 
so cool. So this would have all originally had all of the detail work. And then I don't know if they would have put the plaster over the top of it. I'm sure they had something over the top of it also. All right, so let's go into here. Now this prong here was made out of white sandstone and they have images of like Shiva's and Buddha's, like the dancing Buddha's and stuff like that. And then they carved everything down here on the base. You can see it's all carved and it's just massive. So they have the high threshold here. And then they probably would have had something here. I don't know if this would have been for like the water. And you can see they've redone the ceiling in here, but oh, check that out right there. So there's all the figures. It looks like a chariot. When you go to Angkor Wat, and like Angkor Thom, all of those, and Siam Reap, they have a couple temples that have those inscriptions like all the way around them. They'll have like 500 meters of those stone inscriptions. Oh, this, is, oh, this is great. Now they put that faux ceiling in here. That wouldn't have been there, obviously. And then this has all been redone over the doors. You can see the stone inscriptions. And then these little stone columns on the windows. And uh, the way that they fit those stones is, is amazing. So this has all been restored here. So this is what it would have looked like originally. And then they have a, a Buddha here with the Naga. And they've added some lights here to light this up. I don't think the Khmer were using electric light bulbs. <laughs> and like I said, this was built to be a Buddhist temple. So this is the Buddha with seven Naga around him. And they haven't done as much detail work for the restoration in here, just the, the large stones. It gives you a natural breeze, which is pretty nice. And then you can see out there. So you can see that they have the original archway. And they've kind of supported it up. That would have all been covered. And some more of the inner courtyard. Now they have two of these. I'm not sure what these are. There's one there. And then this goes to the, I'm not sure if that goes to the north. And it has another one of these columns right here. Yeah, I think this is, we're facing towards the north here. Yeah, I have no idea what those two little columns are. So if you know, tell me in a comment down below. And then we'll look back at this. Ah, that's, that's fantastic. So it has all the little figures around the top up there, the Naga on the corner, and then it has the different levels. This symbolizes Mount Maru which it was built to be Buddhist, but Mount Maru is like uh, kind of the heaven for the Hindus. And it was uh, surrounded by a sea of milk. It's kind of like uh, in Greek mythology, you had Mount, Mount Olympus. To the Hindu, they have Mount Maru. You can see more of the covered walkway. I have another one of those stones that would have been part of the, uh, like a deity. So you can't go in there. They're trying to shore up the roof again of that. And just the amount of stone. It always just blows me away how many stones these, uh, the Khmer people moved. Now this is like the southern part of the road. The Khmer Kingdom went into Thailand down as far south as Pechaburi. There's the, what is it? It's uh, what? Kampang Luang, I think was what it is. I've made a video from there. And then it went over to the west to Kanchanaburi. And I, uh, I did a video at Praha Singh, I think is what it is, Mung Singh, which was like the westernmost outpost of the Khmer. And they had that over there to, uh, to protect their western borders. And they have a bunch of other little temples. And along this road, they had rest stations and uh, 
like uh, places to stay the night, little hospitals, all of that along the road. Some of them they found, some of them they haven't. And then they had the main temples. There's uh, a temple in Surin, and the two in Buriram, and a couple others. But this one is the largest they had. So they have all these stones over here, and then it goes over into that. We'll take a look at that in a sec. Looks like they had a, four ponds in here. So they have them in kind of the, the northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest corners. And that's the, the main prong. It's fantastic. I really, really love how they built those like Naga and they stuck them up there. And we have these trees in this courtyard. Right, let's look in this one here and then we'll go to the one on the north side. This is right here. I think it's like uh, one of the gates to this inner courtyard. The steps are in pretty rough shape. We'll take a look in here and see what it looks like. So they have these big holes here. You can see that they would have had the columns around the doorways. And then some more of the same styling. So this is in pretty decent shape here. And you can see the little Buddhas down there on the bottom. These two are a little bit more weathered. And you can see there's quite a few of those big holes. I don't know if those were like for posts or what. Yeah, this is really nice. And then this looks like it goes off into the town here. Yeah, this is the, would have originally had a stairwell that would have went out, but now that's just uh, Pimai. And the road <laughs> bends around this entrance. And you can see it has all the wooden houses, all the normal stuff you see in Thailand. And then this looks back into the ruin. Okay, so let's go look at the north gate. Another look at that center prong. And you can see the Buddha image sitting right there underneath it. And then the covered part of it right in front. I think that's one of the little libraries. Yeah, this is absolutely massive. So the, the wall is basically a kilometer long and 600 meters wide. And there's just all this open area here. Oh, this would have been just absolutely amazing to see when this was being used and the Khmer were here. But now we can just walk through the stones that they left behind. So over here they have a lot of them set up for restoration. That's what all these are out here for also. All right, here's the north gate. It doesn't look like it's in as good a shape as the one off to the east. It has these huge boulder, or huge stones, really high archways. You can see some more of these stones that are stacked up and carved. Uh, it's fascinating. You can see how they cut the corners of those. They cut them at 45 degree angles on the top and the bottom, and then they put them in place. And up here, these stone arches. Oh. So how in the world did the ancients set those stones up? I would like to know. I mean, they had some kind of block and tackle system maybe, or it could be possible like what they did in like Egypt is they would, uh, pile up like sand here, and then they would drag it into place, and then they would dig the sand away after they had it stacked up. Oh, this is fantastic. And this is the farthest north part of it. So this would have been a covered entranceway also, and that just goes into the town. Let's take one more look here at this internal compound. There's the center prong, and then the inner wall with those faux windows. Oh, this would have been just absolutely amazing to see. And then the outer wall. And over here is the east entrance. And it, here comes the rain. So this is called a banalus. 
and it was uh, built over here to store religious documents. And it's just inside of this compound. And then there's another one of those water storage things over there. And it looks like they have some remodeled Buddhas there. And I don't know if we can get into this or not. This is the Eastern Gate. Looks like they have a truck over here doing something. So they have a hole cut in the wall so you can kind of see how wide it is. They haven't spent very much effort in remodeling this one over here. And here's kind of the base of one of the buildings. And then they have just this little part of it. So it doesn't look like there's any way that they're letting you inside of this right here. So all we can do is just walk around the outside. Guys, that's gonna finish up our video out here. This has been on my list of things to come and see and do. So I had some free time today. So I jumped on my motorcycle and rode over here five hours to come and take a look at this. And then when I'm done, I will ride five hours and go home. It's uh, definitely worth it. That's what I like to do. I like to get out and explore. Plus I just like to, to go places and see things. And uh, definitely if you're in this area, stop and see it. You won't regret it. This is a fantastic ruin. It's uh, not as in good a shape as the one on the hill in Burry Ram, but it's bigger. The one in Burry Ram is fantastic, but this one here is, is great also. Definitely worth your time. So I would highly recommend it. It's worth 100 baht to get in here. That's like three US dollars. And if you know some things about this that I kind of skipped over, or if you know some more details, tell me definitely in a comment down below. I have uh, some of my viewers that really enjoy these old Khmer temples. So I really enjoy talking about uh, some things that I don't know. I'm always open to learn a little bit more. So if you know something about it that I didn't say, tell me in a comment down below and uh, I would appreciate the information. And if you're new here, subscribe, stick around, and then you're notified when I post a new video. If uh, you like the video, definitely smash the like and share it with your friends if you want. And until next time, from PMI, remember, life is a journey. Until next time. Enjoy. Enjoy.